you are a journalist and you have done some projects also with the BBC News, with the Vice News. Uh, uh, can you tell us about your interest to become a journalist, especially from a place like Kurdistan of Iraq? Uh, uh, so uh, the, the, the journalism that I do is in form of uh, documentary filmmaking. So like, I don't write articles, I contribute in making films. And uh, I firstly started to work in uh, in a production company. That's how I was introduced to the world of filmmaking. And I really liked it. So, and then I decided to work on a documentary series. Uh, it, was, it was a short documentary series focusing on Kurdistan and uh, just youth and women. I liked it. And later I decided to, with a colleague that I was working with um, on the documentary series, we decided to uh, make international films instead. And uh, we continued and we we together, we made films for BBC and Vice News. And this is when I was like, Khalas, I really want to do this. It's really important for me. And uh, it has been uh, uh, maybe may, four years that I've been working in filmmaking and just uh, less than two years that I have started making films for international media outlets. And, and I'm really, I'm loving it. Spida, what are some challenges that you have faced or you are still facing uh, uh, while trying to do your job over there in Kurdistan? Um, you know, as a journalist, I'm sure you have a lot of challenges uh, as a journalist. Um, but as a female journalist making working in filmmaking, your challenge you, you have the main challenges and you have other challenges. Uh, and my challenges, I would say... Um, the, the nature of documentary filmmaking requires you to travel and to stay until late at night and to um, to stay in places that you know, any for the society is why would a woman go there like you know made a film for about a Peshmerga and we stayed in the military base for a week in the military base like we would wake up uh, like for 4 a.m and start shooting them at 5 a.m when they would do so this whole thing was like it was a new thing um, for my family and for women in the Kurdish society. Is yeah, many it's it's a, it's not acceptable for so many families. But um, I would say besides the other challenges, I had these challenges like I would call it traditional challenges. Um, but I never cared, <laughs> and I continued. Uh, uh, other challenges I would say um, is that uh, sometimes you talk about an issue in the community uh, um, it's an important issue you want to fil make a film about it but you would see that um, people are not really aware of it especially that's the case with um, with women related uh, um, cases um, that they 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 are not aware that they are not uh, they don't want to talk about it or they 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 are scared to talk about it even though there is something like it's a, it's a red flag and someone has to point it out and I have an example of that uh, we worked on a film about uh, online sexual harassment where it is serious it's real um, and we we wanted to make this film we shot it halfway but we did not find any women to be to feel safe enough to share her stories with us her story even if it's with hidden identity you know this is the case with like especially teenagers when uh, you know her pictures would be shared and the guy would uh, would threaten her if, if he doesn't he, if she doesn't do this and that with him he's gonna expose her and share her pictures and because she's scared of her because we still have honor killing unfortunately she's scared of that and her for, for her future and scared of her family to do something um so she would you know obey him and and unfortunately Unfortunately, to say that um, the result of or the solution for these cases by the community is viewed to marry the the victim to the harasser, the guy who is har they marry that they see this as the solution. And she's a teenager; she's fourteen. And she she's a teenager. So, um, or unfortunately, the other option is owner killing. So, my my point is that there's other other op there are other cases. Uh, sorry, there are other subjects that. Uh, you want to talk about including this one but you see that people are they, they or either they don't feel safe enough to talk about it or they're not aware of it they're not aware of it. that's it's a big issue 
And absolutely, there are like so many of like these issues that our community and the communities in Iraq in general, they're facing. Speda, do you think that for to be a good journalist, you need to have the courage uh, and also speaking the truth regardless where you live? Well, as a, as a journalist, I think you should always speak the truth. Um, but I believe every journalist has uh, has um, uh, say a specific thing that that person has uh, pas- is passionate about a specific case. Um, you know, it could be a humanitarian, it could be the Yazidi case, it could be the women women related. It, each each uh, journalist, I would say, is you know, uh, for me is. Uh, uh, I would say um, from, say, the past maybe 10 years, so much has improved for women. I'm talking about women because things have improved uh, for the past 10 years for women in Kurdish society, in Kurdistan as a whole. Um, I am not sure about the women in Iraq, really. I have to have more knowledge to be able to speak about that. Um, But at the same time, uh, at the same time, like, for the past 10 years, uh, since there are so many NGOs in Erbil and so many expats coming and, you know, Kurdistan is opening to uh, to the world. I remember the case was so different back when I was a kid. It was 2006 and seven and eight. Things were so different. Things were very different. Um, but right now you see... Um, you see this has improved for women and so many other aspects in society, but at the same time, you cannot deny that there's so much, so much more that is um, still a problem, that is that is still abuse, that's emotional abuse, physical abuse, uh, mental abuse, uh, because I think it's a part of the, the, if the part of the traditions. Like, I'm not trying to victimize women here. I'm not doing that, but I'm talking about... Uh, uh, from as a woman in Kurdish society before being a journalist as a woman in Kurdish society there's so much abuse mental abuse by by family members by husbands by boyfriends that women are think that this is okay you know yes they think that this is normal they should be it should be like that it's okay he's a man he's your father he's your husband you have to obey him but what they don't realize is that uh, there is abuse going on so this thing is um, is still on you have been nominated for a Rory Peak Award. What that means to you? Uh, uh, well, it feels great to have, to be recognized, especially internationally. I ha- I did not imagine really. I did not think that this would happen. I would be get I'll get nominated. I think that's because we sometimes, uh, Yanni, we don't value our work and our tells enough but I was surprised and at the same time I think this recognition personally means a lot to me it means that uh, you know people are yeah they are hearing what I'm talking about what I'm saying what I'm uh, what I am contributing to in the films uh it, it, it is it's a great support because as a because oh, as a free freelance journalist uh, you don't have a manager to push you or to get give you a salary raise or to you know you don't have that you are your own manager you are your own boss you're you're contributing to yourself alone so uh this this uh award is for freelance journalists and uh, it's just it feels great to be uh, to be as a kurdish woman working as a freelance journalist to be recognized really and I think your work is amazing. So can you tell us about uh, how did you get involved in some projects in Sinjar and how do you see Sinjar right now? Okay, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, I So first of all, I right now I don't have any current project in Shingal, but I was for recently, until recently I, I was working project on Shingal. In Shingal, uh, first time I, I entered Shingal, it was on a film for BBC where we uh, we filmed with a very very brave Yazidi girl. Her name is Amsha. Uh, she was f- formerly a captive, uh, an ISIS captive, and she is at the age of sixteen. Imagine, and then she escaped, and now she's she came back and she's working as a D miner. So that was my first time uh, 
in doing Shingal after 2014 because I remember uh, I come from a background uh, I come from a background of journalism like my my father and my uh, my uncles are, were journalists and uh, so I uh, my dad would yeah, and he, he would take us to Lalish and he would introduce us to uh, the Shireens there and uh, I remember visiting Shingal as well but that was a long time ago so when I entered Shingal again after 2014 uh unfortunately unfortunately like we went to right away we went to this uh i don't know what the street is called this that they really destroyed um the downtown area with really old houses i don't know what is it called um it was very devastating very 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 devastating to see all that uh ruins and you know you'd see you know generations have lived in these houses hundreds of people did and you see all that has been ruined into just ashes it was very devastating uh but at the same time uh later after a few months later i i went back to shingal again and uh filmed another film about a wedding that was being held in the ruins of shingal and we made a film about it and it it was you know it, it it got me really 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 emotional but at the same time it was beautiful that uh, this bride and groom decided to do their wedding in the ruins and uh, we see all these colorful people dancing around this and i think it hold a very strong message that you know despite everything happened um the people of shingal they still want to, they're still uh, they, they they are still they, you know shingal is still shingal there's still you know life continues so i think that was very emotional thing um yeah i i have worked on in shingal on other projects as well i have made one uh, like i've worked on one international film for bbc and shingal as a local producer and uh, other short uh, social media films i think six or seven social media short social media films and i love i love being in shingal and my favorite town in shingal is, is sunune i always say that they have these bingo nights in sunune so i love being around them and the energy oh. i love the energy is there and right now i see i see movement uh, and last time i was there in a couple months ago i see uh movement in the in the market i see i see people coming back i see women working i see i know many uh women that were held captives before and they came back and they opened their own businesses and i can i can think of i there's selwa selwa is one of them who opened her own restaurant selwa khalaf yeah this this girl is like if you meet her once she she never leaves your mind she's so forever gonna you forever gonna remember this person because of she has such an energy uh she's such a strong woman like i really admire her um uh, badria is also as one of the women that opened her uh sweet shop and i can name other women um uh, you know after everything happened that they are they their their families are depending on the providing for their families and they're working so yeah so yeah i see like a lot of uh, you know step by step little improvement i agree with you that uh, also like these women who have been through a lot now they are not only uh trying to heal but they're also trying to uh, recover the whole community in your opinion like is there a hope like of a uh, full recovery for sinjar in near future or is it going to be in that way it's totally understandable why everyone lost hope and they have all the right to be pessimistic or not have hope um but i think despite that despite uh, not having a lot of hope they are still somehow contributing and i know many yazidi people who went back to to shingal and if you go back there what are you i mean it, yani it's it's your home is still better than the the camps you know and when they go back there they yani it's because yani that's how life is they have to contribute they have to provide they have to work they have to start businesses i i would say i would say i would say that of course there is hope uh because there is the people of shingal this is the yazidi community and after everything the community has been through which is just horrible and so many love it's a horrible thing it's a horrible 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 thing but despite it all the, when you go to shingal i mean you still you still sense the you know that you still sense that 
you know, some sadness, but at the same time, you know, life goes on and that's what the people of Shingal are doing right now. You are trying to achieve your goals and dreams as a journalist. So where do you see yourself at the moment? Have you achieved your goals or you are still working on them? Okay, for my goals and dreams, I don't know. Um, I just know that what I'm doing is important to me and to the community. And what's driving me to work and to, to make these films is because the case is important to me first, you know? And it was important to make films of, about Shingal to make people see the bosses, even if it's little, the positive sides of Shingal. Um, I, I think I'm in a good place in my career, even though, um, uh, even though I would not say it was easy because, uh, but I chose that, you know, I chose to work as a freelancer. Uh, I, I, I had my doubts, of course, because, um, you know, as a freelancer, you don't always have work. You don't always have your income. And I'm, I'm a woman that I want like I'm hundred percent financially independent. So as that having that and at the same time not always having income was kind of tricky, but it all paid off. And uh, and I think I'm in a very good uh, place with my career right now. And uh, I want to continue making films. Um, yeah, and I want to at a point maybe I want to study. Uh, documentary filmmaking and master study masters in it because I have never I've never had an academic uh, academic uh, you know knowledge about it everything I've learned is self-taught and inspired by directors and filmmakers that I've worked with before I mean most people say most of the great directors and most of the people working in filmmaking industry they say don't study it it's a waste of money and time you have to you know you can learn everything on your own uh, but I think at a point of my life, I want to study that. So yeah, uh, that's my plan. And I want to continue making films. And I think there's so much to talk about in this, especially in Shingal and in Kurdistan as a whole. I'm sure in Iraq as well, because we are people who have uh, gone through a lot of hardship. I mean, um, yeah, when when there's when there's a war going on, when there's conflict, when there's violence, you are affected. Even if you're not directly involved in it, you're affected. And your country and your people and your community are affected. So, in these in community in a place like Iraq and a region like Kurdistan, especially a town like Shingal, there's a lot of stories to talk about. There's a lot of people with very strong and effective stories. And you know, success stories, emotional stories, and uh, I want to have a ch I want to have the chance to you know make as many films as I can. Do you have some projects that you are working on right now, like in terms of filming? So for Shingal, right now there isn't any, but soon there will be, uh, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, and and currently. Honestly, what I want to continue is the film that I, the online sexual harassment film that I told you about in the beginning. Yeah. It has been there for a while, but uh, as I said, like I'm researching for women that's any yeah, that's that feels safe enough to her to share her story, and that's uh, that's kind of you know my priority right now. And uh, yes, and that's great. Uh, what's your last message to every woman? Well. First thing I want to start with is um, if, if you don't want to help her yourself, no one else can help you. Like if you want to do something, you have to to speak about it. You have to reach out to people. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking like this because I know I'm, I'm a woman from the society. I know how, how hard things are and how the society is for all these traditions, and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, I would say like don't be if if you want something uh if you want to if you have a big dream if you want to work somewhere or uh, achieve something that specific thing you want just know that there will be women other women helping you you are not alone but at first step you have to help yourself you have to speak about it you have to want it also I want to say to myself and every woman in Yazidi community in the Kurdish community and whole Iraq that when you see violence, when you see somebody uh, violating uh, your rights and any form of violence, you don't, they, 
you know you don't have to break your arm to admit that you're getting you're you're being vi- any is violence against you you don't have to any you know, there are other forms of violence but you have to detect it and not accept it just be brave enough to talk about it it it's not going to be easy. It is not going to be easy, but you have to talk about it. Yani if somebody, if somebody, whether it's your father, your brother, your boyfriend, or your husband that doesn't allow you to do something that is natural, but because of, unfortunately, the toxic masculinity we have in our community, I would say it again, the toxic masculinity that they think that uh, without even them realizing, you know, it's a true, it's a real thing. Without them knowing, uh, being aware of it consciously, they think that they, they, you know, um, they, 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 they trying to be a man on, on controlling the women and controlling her and, you know, being jealous or being verbally abusive and emotionally abusive, being all these things like limiting her freedom, thinking that if his sister is, um, is working in an NGO where she has to go to, to a town, a different town is affecting him being a man. He's going to be less of a man if he allowed his sister. This is something I'm talking about because uh, because that would, this is not something you hear in the media. I'm telling you this because... I'm telling you this from a from a from a girl before being a journalist. I'm not telling you this out of a data I pulled out from a I don't know a website or something. No, I'm telling you this as a as a girl from my experience, from my friends' experience, from teenagers I have have heard talking about it. These are things that women they you won't hear of an article about it in media but it's a true thing it's a it's a thing when 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 you're not allowed to um to to work in something that you want or you're not allowed to just Danny, do live your life normally because of a male family member so i want uh, my message is that to, to speak about it to just don't be ashamed to talk about it and just yani that's that's you alive yani you have to live and no matter how limiting the traditions are because that would like um i'm i'm, I'm i live in erbil i'm talking about erbil um you know there there there's like this golden area in erbil they call it the golden zone where all the mesalan ngos all these compounds all these expats are including kurdish people they live there but that's only 5% of Erbil, yani. People think that all the women in Erbil are this free and, and, you know, people of Erbil are, you know, this open and cool. But no, you don't see the 95% of other part, the 95 other of part of Erbil when in the villages where, where, where there's so much violence going on, there's so much wrong and women cannot speak because basically... Basically, when they say, and these things, these things can be small, can be looked at small, but they are not small. They are not small. When, when a woman says, um, oh, he doesn't let me leave the house because, oh, it's okay, he's a man, he's angry, he's right, and probably some guy's going to catcall me. That's not right. That's not right. It's, it's something going on, Yani outside of this 5% of Arabi that I'm telling you about and in whole Kurdistan and whole Iraq, I'm sure. So I want, I, my message is that to not accept that and detect it when there is a, when there's a problem that detect it and talk about it and yeah, and reach out. And I'm sure there are other people to help, to help them. I know they might not feel safe enough to talk about it because the culture is not on their side. Like literally I can t- give you millions of examples uh, when, yani, when when you talk about something, even, yani, even even like even people in charge, like even the police might be like might be like, oh, it's your it's your wrong. Why were you alone? Why were you not like? Why were you? Why, why would you answer him? He was angry or something like this. You know what I mean? So my message is that no, don't accept that, and always be financially independent. Always, like no matter how rich your father is or your husband, always be financially independent. Thank you so much, Speda, for all your work, uh, for going to Sinjar, for meeting the Yezidis, for doing the projects to make uh, the voice of like these vulnerable uh, communities heard. And I'm also looking forward for your next projects. Hopefully Thank that you. have in future. Thank you so much for being on Dawood Show. Thank you very much, Dawood, for giving me this opportunity and hearing me out. And I um, was happy and I enjoyed talking about these things <laughs> and uh, best of luck with your YouTube channel and um, I hope to see other women in your show